discussion. Uh, the biblical foundations of the family is very, 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 very important to the structure of the world, not just church, but the whole world is really centered around families. And when families uh, are not prospering or when families are in any kind of distress, it spills over into the largest society, which then spills over into the larger world, which then creates the havoc that we many times have uh, in our lives and the lives of people across the globe. And from Genesis right up to Revelation, the entire Bible is really about families and individuals finding Christ, finding the Lord, reconnecting with him, especially since the fall in the garden. So our Bible class tonight will begin with a series of Bible class, at least three different sections on the biblical foundation of the family. Tonight, tonight I'm going to talk about the marriage matrix a little bit, uh, because it becomes the core to the family structure. Uh, and so it should be pretty interesting. So just hang in there, stay there, uh, and, and be a part of what it is that we're talking about tonight in this Bible class. Now, before I get to that, I want to say one of the things that we will be doing in 2021, we're starting a mentor program. I've noticed, and you have noticed, that in the last few weeks, uh, last month or so, we've had a numbers of people who come to church on Sundays, uh, and, and they want to be a part of the family of Emmanuel Temple Church. Uh, you know, because of the pandemic, we have not been able to do some of the things we've done in the past, welcome people in. Uh, the, the new saints class, we're still trying to restructure uh, that because of the pandemic. Uh, we have taken in Sister uh, Mary uh, Parlo, uh, and then we had a family that came Sunday, at least the mother of the family came Sunday, and they want to, to bring their entire family to church on Sunday. So we're going to start a mentor program, and, and we'll, we will talk about this in the next couple of weeks, where when these people come into the church, we're going to assign them to various saints, and these saints will help them make the transition from the world into the church. And especially because times are different, the pandemic keeps us from being that fellowshipping kind of entity that we've always been. But we don't want to lose these people. If we lose them, we want them that they, they leave on their own. So we want to show the kind of love and the fellowship towards them. And so you'll be hearing about this if you're interested in being a mentor. Uh, some of you, I would just ask, would you spend some time with this person to acclimate them, check on them, see how they're doing uh, until they can get their feet really in cement? But uh, that's one of the things we're going to be doing in 2021, this new mentorship program for new people coming in. Again, we still got to work out things in terms of what we normally do, baptisms, uh, uh, the, 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 even the receiving of the Holy Ghost, the traditional way we have done it. We, we might have to put more emphasis on other ways. You know there's other ways to get the Holy Ghost than just tarry it. You can sit in your seat and believe in your heart and the Lord will send the Holy Ghost to you and you'll break out in tongues and praise just like you was on your knees tarry it. Uh, so we, we might need to look at ways that we can get a hold of these people as they come in because they're coming. This year is a year of greatness. They're coming. The Lord is going to do a great work. Sister Tony wrote a song years ago, way years before she went home to be with the Lord, that my house be filled. And I believe that the Lord is getting ready, is on the brink of doing just that. So you hear about that. Uh, biblical foundations of the family, the marriage matrix. That's what we're going to talk about tonight in this first series of lessons on the family. Now, the reason we have these kinds of Bible classes and they become very important. And I know I can hear some of the saints saying, well, we already know this. Well, we might not know what we think we know and we don't know enough of what we do know. So one of the reasons why we study these kinds of subjects in Bible class is to know what you believe, to know why you believe so that you can know how to live it and then how to share, because we're holiness people and we're peculiar people, which means we're in the world, but not of the world. And we do things different than the world do things. That's what makes us different. And that's why Bible teaching is so needful. That's why Bible 
uh, reconnecting is so needful. You might have heard scriptures, but it's good that you hear the scriptures over and over and over. In the Old Testament, once a year, the priests would call all of Israel together and they would read the entire Torah, which was the first five books of the Old Testament to the people. And when they finally grew up and became men and women, they had at least the word of God inside of them and they knew it. Now, did that mean that they lived right all the ways? No, they didn't, but they at least had it in them. And so that's why we studied the word of the Lord so we can get it in us. David said, that word have I hid in my heart that I sin not against thee. So that's why these Bible classes become important. Tonight, we're gonna to talk about this whole issue of the foundation, the family foundation. The satanic plan and purpose is to destroy the family, thus the society. What Satan realized a long time ago when God created Adam and Eve in that garden, he recognized right then that Adam and Eve become the center of the universe. And Satan figured out somewhere in his mind, he figured out if I'm going to reclaim my position, I've got to destroy this family that God created. I got to destroy Adam, I got to destroy Eve, and I got to destroy the relationship between Adam and Eve. Because if I do that, I will destroy the society and without the society, there will be no world. He destroys the family through our values. He knows that if he can get families, we will not be taught values. That's where you learn values through your family. Now, all of us learn different values because we come from different families, but we learn basic values that we all are exposed to, which all makes us one society. We, 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 the values such as respecting each other, the values such as uh, doing what is right, the value of respecting the government, the values of thou not stealing, uh, the values of following the rules. The devil knows that if I can destroy this family, then there will be nobody who can give them, teach them values, and they will go out and turn on each other. He destroys the church because the church actually creates order, which from order comes government. When there is no order, you have chaos, mass chaos. Uh, and one of the things that Satan wants to do is destroy the order that part of the world. There is some order to this world. There is some respect in this world. One of the reasons even in our society right now that the United States government has not crumbled and fallen is because all of us have been taught some order and it probably came from our early teaching in the church, no matter what church you're in. Uh, and then it spread from the churches to the educational systems and from the educational system to the governmental system where everybody follow the rules. In this country, we follow what is known as the a rule of law. Uh, and we follow what is known as the constitution. And we will follow the, the rules of the uh, city that we live in with stop signs. I don't care where you go in this country because of the order, you see a stop sign, you automatically stop. You see a, a, a yellow light, you all automatically slow down. You read a sign that says, you can't come in without shoes and a shirt, you don't go in. All of this comes from us being taught order, government, the Bible in the New Testament expressly tells us, obey those that have rule over you. And it just didn't mean the church and the priests and the prophets and the pastors, it meant also the government. Because without order in this society, it would be horrendous. Uh, we suffer now, but my God, you haven't seen nothing when there's no order. When there's no order, we turn into animals. We become wild. Uh, we, we become destructive. Uh, then he wants to destroy the individual. That's you, your character. He wants your character destroyed. He wants you to be a sociopath, meaning that you're against other people. He, he, he wants your psychological development to be arrested where you don't grow and develop. He wants your emotions to be out of control. And so these are the plans and the purposes of Satan to get back at God. He says, I'll destroy the family. I will destroy all their values. And he's doing a good job of that. We've lost a lot of values. He destroyed the church and the governmental order where there's no structure. And he destroys the individual where he makes all of us almost insane, where we end up doing things that are almost unbelievable to each other, to ourselves, 
and to the, the detriment of the good of society. He wants to turn us from the will of God and from the word of God. And he wants to turn us from the cross and the blood of Jesus. Uh, he wants to us to deny the supremacy and the superiority of the name of Jesus. For the last 2,000 years, Satan has been trying everything in his power to get the Christian church to go against the will of God and the word of God and not to believe in the cross and the blood of Jesus and definitely to deny the superiority and the supremacy of the name of Jesus. Now, what makes us apostolic people a little bit different is because we fight and we stand on the supremacy and the superiority of the name of Jesus. We believe that there's power in the name of Jesus. We believe that Jesus is the name of God. And we believe that Jesus is God. And this is what Satan would want to take from Christianity. And he spent 2,000 years trying to take this away from the church, trying to destroy the church trying to destroy the name of Jesus, trying to destroy those things which hold up this society. The reason we have not gone under because some little mother somewhere in the world was calling on the name of Jesus. The reason this, this world have not gone under is because some saints somewhere, even tonight is crying on the name of Jesus. The reason why we are still here and alive is because somebody believed in the name of Jesus. We don't take it serious enough. We don't take seriously enough the power. And we don't take seriously enough this battle between Satan and, and, and the fight that he is trying to get at God by going through us because he knows God have chosen us to be his people and he would do anything he can stop it. Uh, 2,000 years, I'm gonna go through this real quick. He's, he tacked the doctrine of the church. So the church has been under attack all this time because it becomes the core of what is the family. And very quickly, these are just some of the doctrines that he has uh, thrown out there. We have fought over them. Uh, wars have been fought over them. Uh, people ended up in jail. We argue with other Christians about these things. He's been trying to keep us at odds with each other about doctrines by separating Christianity. There's denominations all over the place. The, when the Lord finally established the church, there was no denomination. It was just the church of God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. But over the course of time, because Satan got into the church and he threw out all kinds of doctrines and flipped us against each other and created denominations, Trinitarianism, the Godhead, the belief in eternal security, universalism. That's that doctrine that says everybody can be saved no matter what you do. Purgatory. That's the doctrine that, they, that came out of the Reformation that said, basically, if you mess up here, you can, when you die, you don't go to hell. You just kind of go to places, you get it all together. And when you get together, then you can go to heaven. Big doctrine. Matter of fact, it's the center of Catholicism. Then the doctrine of baptism. How, how do you baptize? When do you baptize? Can we sprinkle? He, he sent all of these doctrines to destroy Christianity, to split the church up because the church actually became the order for society, trying his best to destroy what God has for us. It is not God's will for us to be destroyed though. He attacked society and the culture infrastructure. I've listed the modern enemies of the family. These are the things that destroy the family. I wish you had pencil and paper. You could write them down, study them later. Moral laxity. Have we ever lived in such an immoral time of the days we live in? Saints, these are the last days. Uh, moral laxity is all over the place. That means that people do anything. They got no respect for morality. They'll do anything. And it's becoming more prevalent in our society. Promiscuity. That's, and this has reference to sexual uh, induendos. And, and people who will do anything. Uh, then illegitimate births in this society in which we live in. And, and it didn't just start yesterday. This stuff goes all the way back thousands of years. 
but it has come is reaching a crescendo where our society is accepting and it's becoming commonplace. Cohabitation, you've never seen so many people living together uh, without the, the, the luxury of marriage. They just live together. Uh, in the last 50 years, it has become commonplace. People just figure this is what you do, but this is not what God had intended. He had intended, and he definitely did intend it for the church and for the saints. You just don't cohabitate. You don't do that. Pornography. Uh, one of the, the ills that come out of the cyber technological advanced age we live in, pornography has taken over in so many avenues until it's destroying the family. Uh, many, many families are destroyed when the man, the head of the house or the father gets caught up in pornography and can't get out of it. Uh, one, the only thing that can change many of these things are prayer and fasting. And we live in a society where how prevalent is fasting and praying anymore? When the last time you heard somebody that want to go on a three-day fast by themselves until they got some kind of deliverance from moral laxity, promiscuity, uh, cohabitation, all that kind of stuff. Humanism, hedonism. Th this is the uh, philosophical belief that says man is more important than anything. And we know that that's not the truth. God is way more important than we are, but they're people. And out of humanism and hedonism comes atheism and agnosticism, where people don't believe in God, or some people don't know if they believe in God or not. And that group is growing at a large rate. Uh, number seven says trial marriages. This prenuptial thing that came out of our culture has taken the world by storm. It was the time when if you had a lot of money, you would get married and you would sign a prenup so that you wouldn't lose your money in case there was a divorce. But now it becomes the order of the day. People get prenup today and either, neither one of them got $25 each in the bank. And it mounts really to some kind of trial marriage. The Lord never intended for marriage to be trial. trial. You don't get married and say, well, I'm going to be married for three years, but then after three years, I'm going to quit. Well, if I don't like this, I'm getting out of this. This is the attitude that is destroying the family structure and is all perpetrated by the devil himself trying to destroy all of us. Eight, the high rate of divorce in this country. Uh, in, in the times when we live in, everybody, if the Lord don't hurry up and come, and if the church doing the best it can to try to hold society together, everybody would be married three or four times in a lifetime because of the things I just said. We live in a society where people disregard the word of God and they just figure if this don't work, I'll try again next time. Not knowing that psychologically and emotionally, usually people are drawn to the same kind of people. They might be married to somebody, don't like them, divorce them, and they go right out and marry the same kind of person all over again uh, because they don't understand the dynamics of selection and the dynamics of marriage. We once it established the kind of person you like. That's the kind of person you're going to be with. Uh, nine, hyperfeminism, womanism, comes from that Jezebelian spirit. Now we, we honor women. We thank God for women. We thank God for their talents and their gifts. And we thank God for their leadership. But the Lord was against hyperfeminism, which was exhibited by Jezebel when she took over control from Ahab. I know that there's a whole the, a theory out there that she had because he was an idiot. Well, he could have been all the idiot that he wanted, but God was against hyperfeminism. Uh, Jezebel almost brought down the kingdom. The Bible said that she eventually died and the dogs ate everything but the, sin of the, uh, the palms of her hands because she had taken her place over her husband's place and she ruled as a man as opposed to ruling as a woman. And that doesn't say that women can't rule. They can rule, and many times they have to rule. But you can't never get away from those principles. 10, legitimization of same-sex marriage. We, in this generation, last 20, 25 years, we have, in this country, and not only in this country, but across the world, legitimized same-sex marriages, which really destroys the family. He destroys the family. Same-sex Individuals cannot pre, 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 pro, create, procreate, <laughs> thank you. They can't do it. And that's not what the Lord had in mind. 
That's not what he had in mind when he created Adam and Eve. But we live in a society where we have completely uh, went against the teaching of God and finally legitimized, which says that now it's completely okay, which has put a strain on the family and is destroying the family. Now you wonder why is the Lord gonna come back soon because of all these things, leaven, abortion, okay? Uh, and I'm talking about re abortion without restraint. I, I, now we, we could talk about, uh, uh, you know, it's wrong to kill. We know all of that. And, and, and we don't have to even consider medical reasons and what have you. But these people who are hyper choice, pro-choice people, who decide this is my choice, has nothing to do with medical reasons, has nothing to do with uh, uh, sickness, this is without restraint. This is what the Lord really is against. He's against it. And it has turned into a political issue that has split this country down the middle. I don't know about other countries around the world, but in America, abortion is a huge big thing. But all of these doctrines, come about all of these environments created by Satan himself over thousands of years to destroy the family, which will eventually destroy the society, which will, as I said for the last couple of weeks, set the stage for the Antichrist to come in and take over. Then number 12, and I add this myself, the elephant in the room is the power and the influence of electronic media, the internet. Started with the invention of the telegraph and the telephone, and the television, and now we're in the world of the internet where you can see and do anything you want to in the privacy of your own home uh, because of uh, what we have been able to create. The technology is fantastic. Look at what we're able to do tonight. We can't be in church, but we can sit here and watch each other on this little screen and we can talk about the word of God. But when you get God out of his place, you can take the very blessings of God and misuse them, which is what we are doing in the society we live. High rate of divorce, which I talked about, uh, uh, the elephant in the room is electronic media. Uh, people have, I keep telling the saints, you have to be aware how you use Zoom, how you use YouTube, how you use Facebook. Uh, sometimes saints get on Facebook and they, they write stuff that you just cannot believe that a saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, baptized person would even put on Facebook. Uh, not to mention that you just put everything out there for the whole world to see what's in your mind. And, and you wonder how can that be in your mind when you speak in all them tongues you speak in. Uh, but that's what happened and this is what the devil wants more than anything. Not to mention, as I always try to mention, that it is be it will be the instrument used by the Antichrist to contact the whole entire world at the same time. The gospel is the lifeblood of Christianity and provides the foundation for countering culture and the agenda of Satan to destroy the mankind. The only thing that can stop all of this is the preaching of the gospel. That's why the church got to continue to do what we're doing. We got to keep preaching. We got to keep teaching. Even this old holiness teaching that we're doing tonight, somebody's got to tell it like it is. Somebody, that's, that's the difference many times with uh, apostolic people uh, and, and they laugh at us and they talk about us because we seem to be a little bit behind the, the eight ball and we seem to be a little bit behind the times and we're not culturally engaged, but somebody has got to keep preaching this gospel or we're all gonna be in trouble. Look what the saints, saints right now, I'm talking worldwide, talking America uh, at least, we're out of control. Saints are doing everything. They're doing everything, acting like the world when the Lord said, be in the world, but not of the world. Saints going everywhere. They have no regard, but the gospel is the lifeblood of Christianity. It provides a foundation and it is the only thing that can keep a family together. And it's imperative that we are aware of these attacks if we are to confront them. That's why we're having this Bible class tonight. We've got to be aware if we confront them. Now, you know, I, I believe in modernism, but I believe in the word of the Lord more than I believe in modernism. The Lord said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, 
The love of the Father is not in him. First John 2, 15. We're in the world, but you can't love it, saints. You cannot let worldliness overtake your life. Are you perfect? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not perfect as you want to be. Uh, you know, you and, and you're waiting for ultimate perfection. Uh, you, you relatively you are perfect because you was the Lord gave you the Holy Ghost. But then there's that day to day part that you're struggling with every day, every night before you go to bed. You ought to find a way to sit down and say, "The Lord, if there's anything that I've done today that I have no business doing, please forgive me, because I don't want to be like that. Please help me." And as soon as you get a chance, you need to get somewhere and get anointed and try to get the strength to go on. But love not the world, neither things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's the message that the Lord leave with us. We're living in a secular age that is marginalizing Christianity as we retreat and accommodate. Listen to this here. Secular age has overtaken the church. Culture has overtaken the church and the saints. And the church has been marginalized. There was a day where people respected the church, uh, but we're being marginalized where people pay no bit of attention to us. And the reason being, because many of us are just like them, or the institution is becoming just like them. Uh, this uh, age that we live in with a, a name it, claim it gospel, uh, the mega church age. The problem with the mega church age is that if it's not careful and, and socially it might be dying out. I'm told that the mega church age is dying out because people want to go back to smaller uh, churches where they can feel a part of a family. Uh, but a part of the issue with the mega church is that it look too much like the world. Sometimes the mega church services are more theatrical productions than they are spiritual worship. Uh, and so we're being marginalized and we're being forced to do things that we can be like them more than they can be like us. And the only reason that is happening because we are retreating and accommodating. And, and many of us, we from a small town, we sit here and think what they do in Chicago, New York, Miami is the greatest thing in the whole wide world. I had a, I had a teenage boy came to me the other day and said, I'm getting out of Sandusky. And I just kind of smirked because I, I remember hearing that my whole life. But what's happening is that the church is being marginalized. We're being marginalized. And the reason being is because we are retreating and we are accommodating and letting the devil come in and letting the spirit of the, of the culture of the world come in. Where is this headed? Well, besides the Lord coming back again, and the end of all things, the greatest deception of this marginalization is the devil trying to convince the world that there is no devil. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to convince us that the Lord is not coming back and there's no such thing as a rapture and that there's no such thing as the antichrist and there's no such thing as be ye also ready and there's no such thing as a devil when we know that there is. We know, we know. Where's this headed? Somebody said to me today, God watched my car. He, man, he was talking about how bad things were. And I said, yeah, he said, I don't know what we're gonna do, what, what's gonna happen? I said, the Lord is gonna come back. So he goes right into, yeah, we're raising the church and da, 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 da. But he don't understand it's about, it's about more than being raised in the church. It's about having the spirit of the Lord in you as you get older. And whatever you do, don't let the devil convince you that there is no devil, because there is a devil, and he's alive, and he's well, he's doing well. All right, let's 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 end up here talking about the biblical and divine purpose of the family. Family is the center of the universe. It creates the stability for the whole society. The purpose of the family, when God put Adam and Eve together, and we'll talk about the putting together maybe in a later session. It's a, it's, it's a, he, he was trying to establish a covenant relationship between God and man. That's what marriage is about. That's what the family becomes, a covenant relationship between God 
and man. That's what the word of God is about. It's a covenant. It's a covenant that he makes with us. When two people even get married, the relationship is a covenant between them and God and then between them and whoever it is that they marry. And people don't understand that. You, they come up there in front of that altar, they got to realize that what I'm doing is making a covenant with God first. And then a covenant with whoever it is that I don't get myself hooked up with. Because when you make the covenant with God, you can't just break it. Somebody else say amen. <laughs> you just can't break it when you make a covenant with the Lord. I'm not saying it won't be broken. Let's face it. We have broken it many, many times. But just because we break it does not mean that it's right. It does not mean that this is what God had in store for us. To establish a marriage as the foundation of a family life in the covenant. This is how God was going to take care of Adam and Eve. He's going to take care of them by creating this relationship. And then in the New Testament, he comes down later and he makes it very clear. This is the same relationship that I got with y'all, that y'all got with each other. What y'all supposed to have with each other is the same thing that I have with y'all, that blessed covenant. Uh, he creates his divine purpose of the family to establish one flesh. He makes Adam and Eve realize very clearly that there is to be one flesh monogamy, not polygamy, uh, not many other forms of relationships. There's all kinds of forms of relationships. I guess y'all know that. But he said, I want there to be one flesh. Now, what does that mean? That don't mean that you walk around and you're the same as your mate. But it does walk around and say, when two people are in covenant with each other, marriage covenant, that they're mine should eventually become one. And then they're able to execute the divine purpose of God and keep the divine ordering of God. Uh, we're not animals. Animals go from one animal to the next animal mating. We're not animals. We make covenants. And we make covenant with that person. And then the Lord even tells us, uh, through religion, he tells us, until death do us part. Another reason God created the purpose of the family was procreation and reproduction. It is the way that he decided that the, the planet should be replenished. But he made it very clear that it wasn't procreation and reproduction was not supposed to take place outside of the covenant. So we go back to illegitimate births. And we go back to, and, and, and then this is to saints. Saints have to be very careful, have to protect themselves from all this stuff that comes into their life. You know, you, you, you got to protect yourself spiritually. Uh, for dominion and covenant and fellowship and companionship, the family becomes the agent. Everything you know about relationship, you learn in a family. You learn out of a family. All right? You learn it from a family. You learn it. You learn it through divine modeling. Your mother and your father should have modeled to you how you are supposed to be and how you're supposed to act. They're supposed to teach you. They were supposed to communicate with you. They were supposed to not spare the rod. They're supposed to whoop you when you needed a whoop. They're supposed to discipline you. We live in a society now, if you even whoop a child, you, you, you stand the chance of going to jail. You know, it depends on how your relationship with your child is you that child gets to school and tell the teacher that he got a good whipping that you the, the police show up at the door and pull your child out of your house and take him down to uh where brother kyle and them were but god didn't intend for that he said the purpose of the family is for the mother and the father to model to teach to communicate to discipline so that these children when they become full grown adults and when they get in a covenant relationship with another individual, and when they become parents, they then can teach their children how to conduct themselves as human beings and not as animals. Animals sometimes do a better job than we do at raising their young. They teach them what to do, what not to do, and then when they reach a certain age, they let them go. They let them go. I was watching a little cat. Well, I've been watching this cat for the longest. Uh, who crosses our backyard on the way somewhere else. I don't know where he'd be going. 
But the other day, out of clear blue, I saw the cat, and then I saw about two little kittens following. I said, aha. <laughs> and one little kitten got stuck in the fence. The, I guess it was the mother of the father cat. They didn't say nothing, but they came back and just stood there. And they must have been communicating because the little cat, the little kitten come out through the fence and then hopped this way where the, the, the dog cat was and they took off. But I thought about that because what that little kitten was being taught was how to conduct himself or herself. And he learned it from that mother cat. We are called upon to model and to teach our children. Where do you think you learn how to love at? From your mother and your father, whatever they taught you in that house. Either you learned to love or you didn't learn to love. It's all part of that covenant. Uh, where did you learn how to forgive at? You probably learned it in your house when you was taught uh, how to forgive your brothers or your sisters or your cousins or whatever, your family members. How did you learn how to share? You learn how to share because your mama kept telling you, share with your brother. Y'all didn't have a one toy and it was yours, but you had to share it with your brother. Uh, how did you learn how to respect? How did you learn how to dominate, how to be subservient, how to be loyal, how to compete, how to even fail? How many times you failed and your parents, your probably your mother petted you down and told you it's gonna be all right. Come on in here, let me give you some cookies. It'll be all right, you'll be all, you because that's what the job of the family is for, to teach us and to prepare us how to love when we get grown, how to forgive when we get grown. Now, you, sometimes people get in a marriage situation, they don't know how to forgive. And the reason they don't know how to forgive because they didn't learn that and it wasn't modeled to them from their mother and their father, at least not to the extent that shit. There's people who are married, don't know how to share with each other. You see, that covenant says, let me teach you how to share, uh, how to have respect one for the another. Uh, all right. To provide a means for individual completion, to provide a means for becoming whole. That's what the covenant of marriage is about for the other individual to become whole. That's why it takes a lifetime for that to happen. You just don't get married and they tell me the first seven years of marriage is the best and then after that it gets harder and harder. There's probably no relationship more difficult than marriage, but then there's probably no relationship more rewarding than marriage. Uh, same way with the Lord. The covenant that you got with him is very, very difficult at times, but at times it's also the most exuberating experience you ever could have, especially when you develop faith and trust in the Lord. So the Lord teaches us to raise our children in the fear and the admiration of God and teach them godly principles. The divine order for the family, okay? Uh, each family must set in divine order. First Corinthians 11 and three, Ephesians five and three. Many marriages fail when that does not happen. When a marriage is not set in divine order, what it is that uh, the Lord wants them to be. When it's not in divine order. Many marriages fail when that does not happen, when it takes a lifetime to create divine order. You just don't jump out of it because things go wrong. You just don't jump out of it because you're having a rough day today or a rough two months a month. Another thing too, individuals, we go through changes. We go through changes our entire life. What you were when you were 20 is not the same that you are when you're 35 or 40 or 45 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80. We go through changes. But within the covenant, the Lord allows us the greatest relationship that we can have. Let me give you some, some, uh, some really good pointers here. How does this covenant work? Well, God is the head of the man. He's the head of the man, the husband man, which means the, uh, who is the head. And the husband man must acknowledge the headship of Christ. When Christ is not made the head of any family, there is trouble already afoot. When Christ is not the head, God is the head of the church. And then he expects the man to be the head of the family. 
And when that does not happen, you have trouble. You, you, and it might not be severe trouble, but things will not flow the way the Lord would want them to flow. Then the man is the head of the woman, the wife. And she must acknowledge that, not in competition with each other, not in equality with each other, in the natural order of things, we're not talking spiritual here. Now, spiritually, they all on the same wavelength. Spiritually, we all got to be saved. Spiritually, we all got to do what the Lord tells us to do. But when it comes to the natural order of familyhood, it is a responsibility for her to obey and to support him. Now, people get to fighting over that like crazy. Women fight like that oh, oh, crazy. Uh, and there are some men who take advantage of it, but still it's the principle of God. Then children must obey and respect their parents. We live in an age again where children are getting away with all kinds of things. But the Lord taught us from the beginning that it should not be because we are his children and he don't let us get away with anything. So as we are part of the family structure, we should not allow our children to get away with anything. But we're the ones that teach them, as I said earlier, the respect, the love, uh, the obedience, and all those things. So important, so important, so very important. That's why premarital work is important. In the times we live in, I wouldn't marry nobody that I have not prayed over, fasted over, waited on the Lord before, got counseling, got consultation. Uh, then the roles. Let me end up talking about the roles. We live in a patriarchal society, which means God said he is the head of the man, the man is the head of the wife, and the head of his family. These are some of the characteristics of the father. He's got to be the lover. He's got to be. He's got to love his wife. He's got to love his children. He said, love them as Christ has loved the church. And we can go through a whole discussion about what love is. Uh, we could go through all of that. Uh, because love entails way more than what we think it entails. Love is mental, it's emotional, psychological, as well as physical. It's all kinds of things. The father's the provider. A provider means that he makes sure that the family eats and is healthy. The Bible says if a man don't work, he's worse than an infidel. Uh, I always say to these sisters, I wouldn't marry no man until you find out where do you work at. <laughs> What, what, where's your income coming from? Now, if he can't tell you straightforward, then you ought to go on about your business. You know, you ought to go on about your business. You need, and we live in a time now, you need to know everything. You need to know, do you get a pension? <laughs> do I have to share the pension with somebody else? Because he is to be the provider. A lot of men, a lot of young men, they go to girls for girls to take care of them because a girl is subject to get a government check where he can't get a government check. And the reason he can't get a government check is he got kids all over by four or five different women. But if he can find one who let him stay at a house cohabitation, he can get a little money coming in and then probably end up abusing the woman and abusing children and abusing the system and abusing the situation. A real man of God then is a family leader. He leads his family. This is the order of the purpose of the family. He leads the family. He leads them to church. He leads them to godliness. He leads them to following the teachings of the Lord God himself, a really, a real, a real man of God. Now, he might not be no preacher. He might not be the most spiritual guy in the church but he knows what is spiritually right and he leads his family in that direction. The kids, when they live in the house of a godly man and a godly woman, they know there's a, some things we don't do in this house because my daddy ain't gonna allow it or my mother's not gonna have it. And so they got to get out of there to go somewhere else to do what they want to do. Then he is the priest. That means that he should be the one doing the praying and the Bible reading and doing all the stuff that he did, the tithing in the church. He is the priest. He leads the way. That's where you learn spiritual stuff through your family. He's the family protector. He's the family teacher. And he's the disciplinarian. You know, and I'm not telling everybody to beat your children down. 
but you got to find a way to discipline them. Because if you don't, I tell you who will discipline them, the men over at the children's services, they'll discipline them and you won't be able to do nothing or say anything about it. But when you live a life that they model in their home, that, and that does not mean the children are not uh, independent and got their own mindset and some kids are rougher than others. The matriarchal role, that's the woman's role. According to the scriptures, book of Genesis, we'll probably talk about the dynamics of Adam and the dynamics of being Eve later. A wife is the helpmeet. She is the supporter to the helper. And the helper is the man, but her job is to support and to help him. That's her role. It's not her role to take over. Uh, it's her role to help, to do whatever she can. Now, uh, in the book of Proverbs, the 31st chapter, it talks about the wife as being the administrator. And it really, really talks about a wise woman. A wise woman know how to even deal with a weak man or a man who she thinks is an idiot. Because sometimes you run into those kind of situations, but it takes a wise woman. But let me say this, no matter how idiotic a man is or how uh, crazy he is, he's still a man. But a wise woman, she can fill in the gap when, for whatever the reason, her mate is not everything that he should be. Now, uh, maybe she should have waited before she married him, because I'm quite sure he didn't become an idiot afterward. He, he probably was one before. But because she didn't pray her way through and did wait on the Lord and didn't get counseling and consultation, she ends up with this character. But then that's when it's called upon her. Now you gotta be wise. You can't turn into a Jezebel because you didn't consider before. Uh, a wife is an intercessor. She prays behind the scenes as well as on the scene. She praying for her husband while he's snoring, laying up on the couch halfway asleep. She praying, Lord, help this man. Lord, touch this man. She telling the kids, y'all go to bed. Don't make this noise. Your daddy got to go to work tomorrow. She, she makes sure that everybody is eating in that house. Oh, my Lord, we have come so far from where God wants us to be. The wife is the lover, the companion. And then I said the confidant, which means that she really, Eve became Adam's friend. Now, I don't know if she was his friend immediately. And I don't know what happened after they ate that fruit. Uh, but it was intended that she was his confidant. She was the one that he would go to and talk about and about private issues and private things. And it was her wisdom which helped him work through the issue. But now times we live in, the comfort nothing leaves, get out of there. Whatever it is, I'm going, I'll see you later. What, what, give me the name of a good lawyer. Her desires, the matriarch, is to please her husband and respond to him, his direction, his needs. Now, when you got two people who are in a covenant relationship called marriage, working together, there's nothing they can't do. You can get two poor people who love each other, who love the Lord, who trying to do things right, they can end up the richest people you ever could see because they're all together. They're a team. They got one mind. That's that monogamous thing, one flesh thing. And they're headed in the same direction. Now you get two people right. who are, they, you get two people who rich as they can be, but they're not on the same wavelength. They go different directions, end up with nothing. You get a woman who works she don't have enough sense to know that even though I work, this money is ours and I got to take this home and tell my husband, this is how much we got. But if she's hiding money in her purse and putting it back somewhere and spending it just on herself and ain't consulted, they'll never have everything they should have. And that's not to say that they still won't be blessed because the remarkable thing about the Lord, he blesses us even when we're not right. He blesses us. There's no competition. He, the Lord never intended for there to be competition between Adam and Eve. Uh, there's no equality. Eve couldn't say, well, I'm just equal to you, Adam, because she wasn't. Adam was the head. She was the support. They was one flesh. And that's what the Lord intended for the relationship to be. And when that relationship works, again, I say to you, saints tonight, it's powerful. Let me say one last thing here, and that's on the children. 
They are trained to obey. This is their role, to honor and to respect under absolute authority and control. The Lord makes it very clear throughout the scriptures that eventually what will happen is that the children will take care of the parents. Now, we live in an age now where you get parents, they get to be a little older, and you can't tell who's a mother and who's a daughter. But the mother should always be the mother. I don't care how young she looks or because, and she always the mother because the daughter is always going to respect her as the mother but based upon how she's conducted herself and how she was trained by the mother. Uh, when you train your children, you set yourself up for blessings in your old age. When you train your children. Yeah, because everybody's going to need somebody to take care of them. Now, somebody says, well, I ain't got no children. What's going to happen to me? Well, the Lord took this principle and he applied it to the family, whereas whoever the eldest was on the man's side, he was supposed to be responsible for the family. When the family works, society works. When the family is in divine order, society works. When the family is out of order, then society suffers tremendously and it's spread throughout the entire world. There are other countries other than America, they have a greater family structure than we have. And so that means their values are higher, their, their morals are higher and all those things that I listed, the, uh, the different uh, things that I listed, they don't deal with because they don't have the divine disorder that we sometimes create ourselves. So that's the beginning of this discussion on the family matrix, the marriage matrix, and what God really intends for us. Holiness, he requires out of us. When you start out right in holiness, you end up right in holiness, and you're blessed by God. Now, I wonder, is there any questions tonight? Is there any questions tonight? Any 